So let's go ahead with the roll call. Okay. Um, President DeWinter. Here. Vice President Lynn Harris. Believe it or not, yes, I'm here. <laughs> Trustee Diaz Nash. Here. Trustee Wheeler. And Trustee Bowles. Great, thank you. So we're gonna move on to the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the council to be routine and will be enacted by one motion without discussion. If discussion is desired, that item may be removed and considered separately. Would anyone like to pull anything out to discuss? Okay. Um, may I have a motion? I make a motion to pass the consent calendar. Second. Let's do a vote. Okay. Um, President DeWinter, what is your vote? Aye. And Vice President Lynn Harris, what is your vote? Aye. And Trustee Diaz Nash, what is your vote? Aye. Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, I wonder, Dina, we'll, we'll keep going, but if there's a way to reach out to the other two trustees. Yeah. Maybe they forgot. Uh, I just sent, I had a telephone number for Austin, but I don't know where I've got one for Shalana. Great. Um, so we'll move on to public comment. Uh, persons wishing to comment on any item not appearing on the agenda may submit to the recording secretary a request to speak. Uh, form. State law prevents the board from taking action on any matter that is not on this agenda. Your comments may be referred to staff for further review. So are there any members of the public on our call? No, there, are, there are not. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to new business. Uh, item number five, demonstration of new lending items in the library's collection. So I'm going to turn it over to super, Supervising Library Assistant, Jonathan Young. Hello there, everyone. Okay, I'm gonna just bring up my presentation. I'm assuming I'm gonna have to share here. Yes, we were saying to John, this is, we're all looking forward to this tremendously. Great. Thank no you. pressure. No, <laughs> I don't know if I can handle this. <laughs> you are a master of men. You're fine. Do you see my presentation yet? No. No? Okay. Uh, oh, whoops. There it goes. Okay. Should be appearing soon? Yep. Yeah, we see it. Okay. And I just want to put it into slide mode here. And I assume you're seeing it in slide mode right now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Oh, and sorry, one last thing. Do you see my laser pointer? Yes. yes. Sweet. But we okay. also see that we've got no notes on the introduction slide. Yeah. I just I just talk from the heart. <laughs> yeah, right. no, I love the photo though. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a note person. I'm 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 a teacher, so I kind of tried to learn to to not use notes too much. Otherwise, uh, you don't pay attention to what our people are are, uh, are experiencing as far as presenta presentation goes. So anyway, I'm here. Uh, my name is John Jung, um, and I am the Supervising Library Assistant of Circulation. And we're, again, we're looking at the tech lending collection. And basically, we're looking at where we are and where we're going. Uh, so here's a picture of me and my Boston Terrier. Her name is Deco. Um, this is a picture of me. As you can imagine, back when I had more hair on my head, less on my chin. And um, I do want to say that, um, well, this is one of my favorite pictures, actually. So, so tech lending. <laughs> tech lending. So what is tech lending? Um, for those of you who don't have as much experience in libraries, uh, tech lending is something that um, we, oops, uh, I 
this slide did not animate. Okay, there we go, sorry. So uh, tech lending goes by a number of uh, names uh, depending on the library um, and depending on the scope of the items in the collection. So um, sometimes some libraries call it the library of things because they lend out a whole number of items. Uh, they also use the terminology of alternative lending, object lending, and then when items get more specific, like we have in our collection, mostly technology items, uh, some libraries will say tech lending or tool lending in the case of some libraries that lend out primarily tools. So why do libraries need collections like this? Well, for patrons, um, patrons have a lot of considerations to make. Space considerations, you know, I'm sure we don't all live in nice big homes where we can store stuff. There's financial considerations. You know, a lot of these items cost a lot of money, obviously. There's frequency of use considerations, you know, like I would love to have a chainsaw, you know, but I'm only gonna use it maybe once a year, if anything. So, you know, why should I buy one, you know, put it in my small apartment, you know, and with the thought that I only use it once a year. So the idea is kind of like try before you buy, which, you know, as we know, in the age of the internet is becoming uh, less and less frequent as far as, uh, you know, being able to go to the old traditional brick and mortar stores to try something out before you can buy it. I guess as, as an example, I'm a guitarist. Um, you know, a lot of the guitars that I, I want to try are ones that I can't actually try uh, at stores because there are not as many music stores as there used to be. So for libraries, what does this mean? Well, why, why would libraries have uh, alternative lending collections? Well, the word here is not access, but access. Um, libraries, of course, are big on providing access to the community for all kinds of things, you know, materials, obviously, information, recommendations, you know, through uh, readers advisories, as well as, you know, as we're talking about in this presentation, all these great things tools, musical instruments, etc., that uh, people can borrow from us. Next. So I want to give you guys a brief history of alternative lending in libraries, mainly because I think it's one of those things that we don't think about when, uh, when we think of libraries. We do think of, you know, books. We do think of, you know, borrowing CDs, DVDs, those kinds of things. But now um, here in the 20 first century, you know, we have to think about, you know, libraries providing more of these items for patrons. So the first generation of uh, alternative lending libraries uh, were in the 1940s, as you can imagine, as a result of the World War II, which caused a scarcity of resources in which to build tools and items uh, for people at home. So um, what happened was a library in uh, Michigan called the Gross Point Library in 1943, in conjunction with uh, some of the local citizens started their own tool library, in which they uh, lent out tools to people. And these were just you know, common, everything from gar common gardening tools, excuse me, to kitchen appliances to you know, even larger instruments. And, um, and I checked online and the Gross Point Library is still around and they're still lending tools. So that's a good, uh, whatever, 80 years that they've been doing that, long time. Keep on trying to click the slide. <laughs> um, so the second generation of uh, alternative lending libraries uh, started in 1970s. And it's not really known why there was like a 30 year gap between in popularity between, uh, you know, the first uh, two libraries and, and the ones that popped up in the 1970s. My guess is possibly communal living. Uh, people were living more in apartments and condos, uh, you know, mass urbanization possibly causes, but overall it's kind of a question mark. But two examples are the Finney Tool Library, which is in Seattle, and the Berkeley Tool Lending Library in Berkeley, which started in 1979, to which our own James was a supervisor at one time. <laughs> Yay, James. <laughs> And the third generation of the, of the uh, alternative lending libraries started actually pretty recently, 2008. Why? Well, technology boom, as I said, it was less feasible for people to go out to brick and mortars and try out stuff like, the, like we used to. <laughs> um, and I think it's just the case that uh, it's a, a concept I call bigger costs for small, smaller living. You know, it's like 
people don't want to sink as much stuff into um, their everyday items uh, as much as they used to. You know, people want to sink money, a lot more money into luxuries, I think, and they don't want to buy it like the chainsaws and stuff, <laughs> like I mentioned before. <laughs> and of course, one example of this is our very own San Mateo Public Library, in which case our alternative lending slash um, tech lending collection started in 2009. I'll give you a brief history of our collection. Uh, we started in 2009, um, this first generation, I, I call this generation what we could get, and I put that in air quotes. Uh, these were items that we got from uh, grants, I believe, from the county. I should put an aside in here that even though I'm currently the, um, the manager of the circulation department, I've only been so for about eight months now, but I have worked in the circulation department uh, here at Sam Mateo Public Library for 15 years. So even though I didn't, I wasn't involved with a lot of the back end of, you know, getting grants and, and things like that, I was involved with the overall um, implementation of the, uh, of the collection within our system. So anyway, Back to uh, our first generation of uh, alternative lending. In 2009, we got these items called kilowatts. Basically, these items that you could uh, basically use in your house to determine, you know, where you had, had hot spots in your house. In other words, you know, places of, uh, where you're wasting electricity. Um, these actually went out pretty well when we first got them. Um, of, um, one of the Patrons made a comment to me uh, one time when he borrowed one. He basically said, "These things are great. It really showed me like how I could, uh, you know, where I could save money, you know, in my house. But the problem is, I don't know how to do that." And I said, "Well, sorry, we don't lend out electricians just yet." So. Next slide. 2017 was the next part of our movement to uh, toward alternative lending, and this is when we started these. Uh, check it out home energy and water saving toolkits, which we obtained through a county grant, if I remember correctly, or it could have been a state grant. I can't remember which at the moment. And these kits were basically somewhat like the, um, the kilowatts in which they help people understand, you know, where possibly they could, uh, they could have cost savings within their home by determining like where possibly there were water leaks or again, where there were problems with their electricity. In fact, you can see here, I circled the old kilowatt <clears throat> made its way into these kits eventually. So we still have these kits available downstairs. And um, so those kilowatts are kind of our, our veterans within our alternative lending collection. They've stuck with us for quite some time now, 13 years. Okay, second generation of, uh, of tech lending is kind of what we're in now. We're at the end of this generation. And I would call this the fund to need round one because we all know that Sam Till Public Library Foundation generously uh, provided the funding for uh, these items. In this particular round, um, when I was with the former circulation manager, we, know, we knew that we wanted to focus on technology essentials because it was certainly the case that uh, actually for a while, the technology divide was a big part of the conversation uh, around the world. And, you know, it was bad enough to say like, you know, in, in countries that did not have, you know, the, the kind of generous funding that the foundation could provide to us, that they did not have these kinds of technologies. But it was even, I guess you could say sadder that, you know, our local communities did not have these, um, uh, technologies, uh, did not have, have access to these technologies, excuse me, except for at the library. And therefore, we kind of wanted to be able to bolster access to these technologies um, for people to be able to enjoy and use at home. So in that, we bought these uh, Chromebooks, which are basically kind of like very limited lockdown laptops, and also these um, MiFi hotspots, which provide internet access to people. And this program so far has been wildly successful. Um, these items are out constantly. Um, people have used them for all range of things from, you know, using them just at home for regular entertainment. People, uh, some patrons have said, yeah, basically I'm running my business using these things, you know, so, you know, when they're out of the house or whatever, you know, they can still access the uh, kinds of documents and things they need. Um, uh, out of the office. So next, 
is the generation we're moving into, which is our fund to need round two. Again, uh, thanks to our wonderful Sam Till Public Library Foundation. Uh, we received funding for things that, you know, when our, when our former circular man, circulation manager came to me, you know, she said basically, you know, hey, we've provided, we've provided, you know, the essentials for folks, you know, those kinds of things that people need to be able to submit a resume, to find a job, you know, to, you know, even to just browse internet in general. So what can we do next? Well, there were some things that we looked at as far as trends went. Uh, we looked at the um, the unfortunate fall of music programs in the school system. I should say more like the defunding of those programs. We also looked at the rise of things too. We looked at the rise of what we call the bedroom producer. I, I consider myself one. My um, I'm a musician. I don't play in a band. I don't play with any friends or anything. I just produce music completely at home. And there are lots of people like me uh, who do that too, both professionally as well as amateur amateurly, I guess we'd say, mm -hmm. in an amateur manner. Um, I'm an amateur in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, the second rise, uh, the next rise, rise of web-based cottage industries, things like Etsy, you know, things like eBay even, you know, people selling stuff, flipping, things, you know, creating things on their own, selling them, you know, those kinds of things. And we also looked at the renewed focus on STEAM programs, uh, particularly in the, um, in the elementary and middle schools. Um, and that's why we came up with this list of items that we're soon going to be adding to the collection. And as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, are currently on display in our lobby in the afternoons on the weekdays and some weekends, depending on who's on staff. So if you ever want to see any of these items, you know, feel free to drop by uh, the circulation area um, uh, again in the afternoons. Oh, and one re other reason why we want to add the items that we're adding to this collection is because San Mateo really is it's one of the external hubs of, of the Silicon Valley, and it's really the headquarter of the maker concept, the, the DIY, and as, as you guys all know, the Maker Fair was the headquarters here, uh, it was headquartered, excuse me, in San Mateo, and now it's all over the world, of course. Okay, so the first focus on items that we're adding to, that we added to the collection were ones that were focused around music and productivity. So you guys might know I, I used to be a teacher, so I have to use my PowerPoint animations here, <laughs> musical instruments. So we added, of, of several things, we added a drum machine, ukuleles. Ukuleles are um, our musical instruments provided by other libraries within our system, and the program to lend them out has been very successful, especially among our county libraries like Atherton, Belmont, Foster City, et cetera. Uh, we have a full 62 key keyboard. It's a Yamaha, really nice. And we have a 25 key Korg. Both of these keyboards are very powerful keyboards. Um, I actually selected all the musical instruments myself based on my knowledge of these things, as well as of course, uh, friends and peers who, uh, who gave me information about, uh, about their use. Part two, productivity. Uh, this is not the most interesting looking item in the world, but it's called a Focusrite Scarlet Audio Interface. Basically, if you're a bedroom producer like me, you need to have basically, I guess you could call it a bridge between your musical instrument and your computer, which is the thing that's gonna be recording your musical instrument. Or if I'm a podcaster, I also need that bridge between my microphone and, and my computer. And this uh, audio interface provides that. Excuse me, I gotta move something out of the way here. Okay, next thing, a portable photo, photo studio, excuse me. This is one item where I, um, at first we were like, what? And then, um, you know, then I thought to myself, well, you know what, so many people, you know, like I, like I mentioned, are, 
uh, are into eBay and Etsy and selling their own stuff, you know, yeah, they would want a portable photo studio to be able to take nice, clean pictures of their items. In fact, this picture I took of the focus right here was taken in that portable studio. So you can see it's a nice, very professional looking photo. And I only used my iPhone to take that picture. And the Spire portable recording units. And these units would be something like, so again, if I'm a bedroom producer, let's say I'm not, I don't have my computer with me, you know, maybe I'm away from home, you know, and I think, man, I sure would love to record, you know, I don't know, I have my ukulele with me. I got this great song in my head right now, sure would like to record it. I can break out my Spire, nice portable uh, recorder. I guess I know I don't want to say anything mean to anyone, but you know, I know we're all of the age that of having portable tape recorders slash boom boxes. Uh, you know, the first time um, I saw one of these, I was like, hey, wait a second, isn't it just basically like a boom box? And my friend said, yeah, it basically is, except for it doesn't really play cassette tapes or a track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the next group of items that um, we focus on were, I would call just edutainment type stuff. So things that we're kind of focusing on both fun as well as entertain uh, as well as education as so so for the beginners um now a lot of people you know a lot of people i think in libraries tend to ask staff you know hey is this age appropriate for my child you know that kind of thing and you know i I think I, I think most of my peers share my view that you know it's not really up to us to decide you know what is age appropriate for your child. It's really up to you. I mean, there we can provide some guidance, but we can't really make that decision. So basically, a lot of times when I say you know when people say like are talking about you know well is this for a younger child or not, you know that's up to you to decide you know. But so instead of like putting an age range on this, I always say hey this this stuff is made for beginners because we have things like uh, cubelets. These are basically uh, small, believe it or not, small robotic items. All these little blocks have sensors on them that have different commands associated with them. So as you build the blocks, you can cause the uh, blocks, for example, to move, light up, spin around, things like that. Uh, we have Playaway launch pads. Actually, these are available now in our collection along with uh, our um, Chromebooks and MiFi's. These are basically just tablets that are preloaded with very various uh, steam related activities, mathematics, language, those kinds of games. Uh, these are snap circuits. This is a really fun way to learn how uh, a circuit works. I should say fun and safe. <laughs> uh, we also have these straw bees. Uh, these are fun ways to learn about geometry and physics. And then also these Makey Makey invention kits. Now these items basically, the Makey Makeys basically allow you to create an interface between just any common household item and your computer in which you can do many really fun things. The famous example um, is the banana piano here, which I have pictured. Um, and basically you can, with these bananas, just basically touch them and you'll get all the different notes of the keyboard. You can see the keyboard here in the, on the uh, monitor of the computer. And the next round, we go to more advanced items. So we're not in the beginner territory anymore. It's a little more complex uh, instruments that we're talking about here. So um, first off down here in the lower left, we have our Lego Boost Toolkit. With this toolkit, you can uh, create a whole number of different items. Uh, I believe there's five, let me make sure. Yeah, there's five. There's a, you can build a guitar, a lunar rover, a cat, a robot, which is pictured here in the picture, a race and a race car. And with um, the Lego app, which you can download, You'd have to have your, unfortunately, you'd have to have your own device, iPad or, or iPhone or, or a, uh, an Android device. You can use the app to uh, basically program different controls into whatever you've created here. Uh, next item here is the Finch robot. Um, this is a robot that's basically programmable and it's based on various sensors that are located around the robot. So it can do things like it can sense 
items that are in front of it. So you can program it to, for example, push the item or maybe avoid the item. So you can do something like, you know, create a maze and program it to go around the maze to find the end. And the next items we have are even more advanced. Uh, whoops, I keep hitting the slide. Sorry about that. It's a typical PowerPoint, old school PowerPoint uh, habit. So in the top left-hand corner here, we have Raspberry Pi and uh, basically a microcomputer that you can use to make uh, for hundreds of projects. You can make anything from like a simple LED sign to a media center, you know, like for example, something like almost like a, a Roku box, like for your TV. You can use it to make video game emulators. You can even use it to create a, a closed circuit TV system if you want to. It's 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 very wide open as far as what you can do for it, do to it, excuse me. And finally, we have what's called a shield bot, uh, which is uh, controlled by an Arduino kit. Arduino is basically a microcomputer, much like a, a Raspberry Pi. And this item is very similar to the Finch bot in that you know you can program it to basically sense uh, items around it. Um, it's there's various sensors around it. There's even I'm told I, this is the one item I haven't really played with them a whole lot, but I'm I'm told it also has some sort of olfactorial sensor which you can sense like smell of some sort. And I'm really interested in trying that out once I get the time to do so which might be my retirement, I'm not too sure. <laughs> anyway, so those are all the items that we've added to, that we're adding to the collection, excuse me, in this next round. And during National Library Week, which is happening in April, um, we're going to be showing all these items in the lobby. And then from that point, we'll be, uh, patrons, excuse me, will be able to, to uh, borrow them from us. So that comes to the end of my presentation. It's my beautiful dog again, and I invite any questions, if any. And thank you for listening, too, by the way. <laughs> of course. Great presentation. Um, I see Trustee Diaz-Nash has her hand up. Yes. Yeah, I'm just this is so excited. This is wonderful, John. Thank you so much. I would love to suggest, uh, Chair Winter, that uh, when this is up in the library, that we do a session with the board and we all go down together and do a little, you know, try out because there are all these things and I think that would be lots of fun. So, John, maybe if we can coordinate with you, that would be really Sure. Fun. Sorry, um, I didn't mean to interrupt, but sure. <laughs> good, 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 good. That'd be great. And hopefully we can, we can get back together. I'm interested in, I mean, you're, you're so, you know, listening to what your customers are looking at, what they're interested in. How does what we are collecting or offering compare with other libraries in both the you know the the, the county as well as the regional system, um, and mm. versus other libraries around the country? So that's a good question. Um, now I, I've actually worked in different libraries within our system, and I've I, I've actually worked in the library down in Santa Clara. I, I live down in San Jose. And I think as far as our system goes, Pencil Library system, this is pretty far beyond what the our libraries are offering. Uh, most of our libraries are only offering like hotspots, um, laptops, uh, like I said, ukuleles, um, and some other items I know of, but like things like robots and Lego sets are, yeah, definitely far far beyond what what they're offering now as far as like let's say santa clara county goes um i used to work at uh, los gatos library and we do have a number of these items like uh, these number of like, i know we do have like a um a couple of like robots we had excuse me because i don't work there any longer but we they have i should say a couple of robots and, and a couple of steam related things that they do check out to patrons and i would say that um their library is one of the more innovative as in terms of their offerings goes. So I'd say we're kind of like on par with with them, uh, roughly speaking, although they've been offering their items for a little longer than 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 obviously we have at this point. Um, 
and as far as San Jose goes, San Jose, you know, obviously they have, I think they have a lot more funding uh, for, uh, you know, for better or for worse. And they, they do offer a lot of, uh, not these exact items, but similar items, again, steam related items, you know, that's the big thing in this area, so. Thank you. And, and I would hope that when we get started, that we keep real close track as to who is interested in what so that we can learn, because I bet we're going to find some surprising results that people we never thought would be interested in X are just going crazy about it and, you know, otherwise. So that kind of learning will please bring that back to us. That would be really interesting. Yes, yes. I um, One of the reasons you know, initially when I wanted to put a display out in the lobby, like we like we have now, my first thought was like, that's too early to put out in January because you know we want to make them, uh, you know, available in April, which is like a few months. So I did ask staff, you know, hey, when you guys are, you know, when when you see patrons there, you know, come up and ask them and ask them, hey, what are items would you like to see in our collection someday? You know, so I I've been taking, my staff have been taking notes from that and they've been they've been uh, telling me, you know, exactly what people have been saying. So I've been keeping a running list of, you know, items that are desirable. And some of them are, I'm like, yeah, I want that. You know, I want, I'll be the first one to check that out, you know, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, that, that's definitely something in the works. John, I had um, a question and uh, also a comment. One question is how long will people be able to check these out for? Yeah, all tech lending items, um, you know, from the hot spots down to all the new stuff that we're adding will be three week, uh, three week checkout, non renewable. Okay. And the other thing, just building on Elisa said, um, I think the tracking is also great just to see if, if a couple of things go out all the time, maybe we would want to purchase additional of the same thing. Oh, yes, that, yeah, I'm sorry, I misunderstood her initial question. Yes, we do track that, um, the, we do have checkout statistics that we can look at, and I would definitely, yeah, consider if someone was really, if, if one of these items was really popular, you know, let, let's look into getting, you know, one or two more, maybe. That's great, just, just a great presentation, so thorough with the history and how you laid out the categories, oh, excellent. Thank you, appreciate Liz? it. Yep, yeah, uh, Lynn? Just real quickly, I um, wanna say thank you to John for his, um, his vision um, and helping to put together, especially all the musical um, aspects of this. Um, this was a very, very successful fund and need. Um, and it happened a while ago because of COVID and some changes in administration. So. Um, I also want to applaud his marketing, which is, you know, displaying it in the lobby so that people can see what's going on. And I appreciate the thanks to the foundation. And I hope that uh, when this is really opened up to the public, um, we keep pressing that, uh, that knowledge that that's where it comes from. Because I think in the future, if we want to go back to our donors and say, look how successful this is, um, they tend to like these kinds of projects. They get very, very excited about them. So um, all kinds of um, excitement around this uh, kickoff finally. I'm really delighted. And I wanted to thank Jonathan for the, for his hard work. Also, I mean, I, he didn't mention this, but they revamped all the storage spaces. You know, it's, it looks beautiful. Um, they've really, they've got it well organized um, for people to take advantage of the collection, which is great. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Trustee Lynn Harris. Well, thank you, Chair DeWinner. Uh, that, Jonathan, this is just fantastic, very exciting, uh, kind of inspiring uh, in, in a way as well. So really appreciate it. I guess my, my question is, are there other items in the third that did not make it into the third generation that you know, you're, you're probably well aware of a, a few other things that ah, maybe not quite yet, but those might be kind of fourth generation and you're always going to be kind of assessing, you know, is there, is there a need for this? Should we include it? Uh, not, not that there's anything missing. I think it's fantastic. I'm just kind of curious as to what, if anything, you kind of foresee might be coming down the line. 
Yeah, I, I could definitely see things. I mean, you know, obviously as a musician, I, I was pitching all kinds of musical instruments to um, our former manager. Um, ultimately, I would like to see more like household items, things like kitchen items would be great, you know, like, you know, things that like instant pots, you know, I mean, I, I think like, you know, that's, that's one item that I think people are always interested in, like, at least trying out, you know, because I mean, I've had an instant pot for like nine years now. And every time I mention it to people, they're like, Oh, how does it work? I heard about it, you know, oh, can I try it out? And I've actually lent out my instant pot to someone before too. So something I would like to see more household stuff, you know, um, I think those are the kinds of items actually, as I mentioned, people have been requesting when they come up to uh, the staff um, in the lobby. It's always been, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, induction ranges, you know, things like that, or even just like common kitchen tools, like, like someone suggested, why don't you guys get a blender, you know, sewing machine, uh, that's been mm -hmm. mentioned two or three times already, you know, I mean, you know, I wouldn't mind having a sewing machine, like just to check out just so I can mend some of my clothes, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. No, that'd be very interesting. It'd be a whole nother kind of uh, constituency you'd be appealing to. So uh, no, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I'll unshare now. Yes, James. Is my raise hand feature working? Yeah, I see it now. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Well, um, first of all, I wanted to thank John. That's actually one of the best presentations I've ever seen. Um, it, it actually explains some things to me. So um, number one, um, I would love for us, I mean, in a dream world, I would love for us to have a tool in the library here, but the idea of like cooking items, loaning those out, that would be great. And that's one of the things that would be helped if, um, for example, we could convert some of our space because some of these things need to be stored yeah, properly. Yeah, um, and, you know, in my old tool lending library in Berkeley, they did begin lending out shortly after I left cooking items. And it was just like the, the tools, like home repair tools. It was the sort of things that people wouldn't use regularly. Like they may need every once in a while, like very specialty type pots or very large uh, items, et cetera. So the, I actually have a question for John. What is a Roku box for your television? A Roku uh, box is, is a set-top box. So basically, uh, um, I guess, you know, the big case, the, the case use is, um, you know, people who want to access Netflix, you know. Uh -huh. you, know I, you know, obviously you have the apps and things like that, but, um, you know, some folks like to have, it's basically like a little box that can act that can access these different kinds of apps mm -hmm. so um you know it's really good for people like me actually i'm a, a cable cutter i don't have cable any longer i don't have any kind of terrestrial tv any longer because i never watch it mm -hmm. and but i still want to access you know my movies and occasional news and occasional sports so I can buy one of these set-top boxes. It's basically just like a little device like this, you know, plug mm -hmm. it into my TV, plug it into the HDMI. Then I have access to all kinds of different uh, apps, which I can use to watch movies. You know, Hoopla has its own app on, on the Roku box, for example, oh. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Or Am I the you, only one that didn't know what a Roku box is? Did, did, you, did you know that that is, Lisa and Rod? There are lots of different ones. I feel better. I, yeah. I happen to know we have one, but <laughs> okay. basically just think of it as a traffic cop. Okay. There's all this stuff happening, right, John? Yeah. Sort of like, okay. Really figure it all out. Ooh, I learned something new, and that was an awesome. That was a really great presentation, John. And several there people made Thank several you. billion dollars on Goku. So there you go. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And there's Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say they're headquartered down in Los Gatos too. So, <laughs> so oh, they're local. Right. Yeah. Uh, Chesty Bowles. Hi. So, sorry. Sorry I'm late. And sorry if you, you already covered this. Um, awesome stuff. Just really exciting direction that we're going. I was thinking about the type of people or um, students who are going to be checking out some of these. And it seems like, I mean, this goes maybe to your question a little bit, James, it's going to be a lot of people who already know what it is and are already interested. And I was wondering if there's any thoughts of combining it with programming 
to invite people who might not already be interested and then use that as kind of a kickoff to say, and if you want to keep doing this, you can check it out. Um, sorry if you already covered covered that already. Yeah, but. that's a great question. Uh, yeah, no, we didn't. And I would love to do something like that. I mean, um, you know, part of the first thing when I was, you know, given this position, I don't want to say given, but earned the position was when I was appointed the position. First thing I knew was, okay, I have this tech landing collection I got to push out. Now I got to learn how to use all this stuff. <laughs> so, so yes, I would like to see something around that. Um, I've, I work in the circulation department. We typically don't do programming. I would love to be able to, to speak with, you know, my fellow managers in the other divisions and get that going. The children's department does have its own collection of which they have some of the items that we have in this collection, in which they can use for programming or for lending out or, or whatnot. So it's kind of like, in some ways, you know, our collections, meaning um, circulations and children's are kind of complementary of each other. And, and we do sh kind of share some common items that, I, that they've already actually used for programs. So like that. that's kind of in the way a little bit, uh, on the way a little bit, excuse me, but I would like to see more things happening. Um, you know, like I said, the first thing, you know, when I first joined in as the manager, I was like, oh, oh man, I got to learn how to do all this stuff. <laughs> so that's going to be part of my learning process too. It'd be fun to partner, like when you think about the ukuleles, we have multiple ukuleles, so it'd be fun to partner with an instructor and do a class and then people can take them home. Exactly. In fact, I do know a couple of instructors that I've been talking to, uh -huh. trying to see if maybe they want to put a, like maybe a concert together or something or, or at least like show, like uh, teach in a group or something like that. That'd be yeah. great. And any other thoughts or questions? Thank you so much. It's an excellent presentation. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. Can't wait to go try it out. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So we're going to go on to the next item then. Uh, number six, San Mateo Public Library Impact Report 2020 to 2021. And Senior Management Analyst uh, Marcia Mendonca. Welcome. Hello. Um, can you all hear me? Hear me well? Yes. Um, good evening, members of the Board of Trustees, um, library staff, and foundation staff. Um, we're happy to present the 2021 impact report to show all the great things that our staff continue to, to do um, during some challenging times. So let me pull up my... Okay. So bear with me, I'm working from home uh, right now. It's a little more challenging on the computer, on the laptop. Um, can you all see the impact report? Yes. Okay. Just moving something out of the way. Um, so the impact reports, there's so many things happening in the world right now and time seems to be going really fast. So just to bring you back, um, this is um, 2020, 2021. It's starting Ju uh, July, 2020, and it goes through uh, June, 2021. So this was, um, at that time, we were moving from curbside pickup into allowing some of our, our patrons in the lobby to pick up their holds and also to access computers uh, for a limited time. So we have, um, as far as the format, we use the same format as uh, the previous year, like, uh, 2019 to 2021, which was, uh, to 2020, excuse me, um, which was a new format. So we, we think, um, we really enjoyed the, this format and wanted to use it for at least one more year. Um, so we've chose, chosen our task force, chose one of our professional photos of the library. This is the second floor study area um, in the atrium. Um, 
going into the second page, this is our message from our city librarian, James Moore. A very nice message from, from James. Excellent photo as well. As well, exactly. <laughs> um, and we also list um, this page, we list the library board of trustees, so all the members, all the members of the board of directors for the San Mateo Public Library Foundation and the foundation office staff. So we're going into the next page. This is, um, we called it a year in numbers. This is just a sample of the statistics that we keep at the library. Um, the comprehensive list of stats that's sent to the California Public Library yearly. Uh, but this, we chose just a few, just a sample of um, statistics that we thought were important to showcase. In this page, we also, um, we, we uh, decided to show our library motto, which is discover, enjoy, connect, and learn at the San Mateo Public Library. Um, and then going into curbside and welcome back. So this is the time when we welcomed um, our patrons back. This is our lovely library, uh, children's librarian, uh, Jordan Bumber. We um, talked about the wonderful work um, she was doing with the children's and seniors for um, Black History Month. So for all of the pages, we decided to use a picture, a paragraph that highlights the services and programs that we offered along with um, a testimonial from library patrons and the sample of the services. So here we're talking about welcoming back our patrons to the library. Um, we have a sample of, on the left side, we have a sample of um, some of the programs during that time. So we had curbside service, uh, self-service holds pickup. This is when patrons were allowed in the lobby to pick them up. Um, surprisingly, the library was a, a voting center at that time, even though our building was closed um, to the public, but we uh, were able to make that happen. We have some in this page, some statistics for um, the circulation uh, division, as well as the information services um, department. Going into the next page, we talk about um, outreach and access. So how the public was able to continue to access our services um, during those challenging times. So we were out in the community with Mateo. In this picture, we have um, Adriana Valencia. She's our children's supervising librarian. And uh, Jordan Bumber, once again, she's our children's librarian. At one of our events, um, with outreach with Mateo. And a sample here of the events that we hosted during that time. Story, story times at the parks was very popular. Home delivery services, uh, that was the pilot program, but it's now a regular, um, or service, not a program. It's now a regular service. Uh, library Cards for Student Success Initiative was very popular. We signed up a lot of students during that time. Chromebook Cafe um, was also a great initiative by our staff to offer Chromebooks, Chromebooks and also MiFi outside the building while we were closed uh, to the public. Summer Learning Program, again, was very successful. Um, the DVD bundles, people took advantage of those services in the um, mixed bag the teen mixed bag books, very popular as well. And some of the stats, so we've had almost 112,000 internet and database sessions. So a lot of people reaching out to our online services. Um, next, we're going into virtual events and programs. Um, our staff was did an amazing job at, at pivoting from our regular programs, in-person programs, and events and um, moving it every, moving everything to the, the virtual space. So we've hosted 385 events and programs. The African-American Cultural Committee 
was very active during that time. The writing workshops, grab and go craft and STEM kits was very popular. Reading Buddies um, offered virtual programs, book discussions. Some of these um, um, pro, uh, events we've hosted online. Some of you here present took advantage, uh, for example, the science and health seminars, um, financial educational series. These, these were all very popular. And the picture here is, um, this is a picture of our first um, in-person event after the pandemic and, and reopening the building. So this was an art exhibit by um, Julian Schuster. Um, he's a French artist. So for this event, we had the artwork in the Oak Room and we had um, a message from the artist on the screen uh, because he was, he was and is back in France. So that's the way that we, we've got him to, to participate in the event. It was a lovely event. We could tell that the community was happy to be back inside the library building. Um, and here on the left side, we um, highlight the number of program attendance for the year. And the last page is a last but not least, it's a very important page. Um, it shows the work of all of the organizations that support the library. Um, in the picture here, there's some familiar faces from the foundation, from the, bo um, the board of trustees, library staff, volunteers, and this is just one photo. There were many volunteers there um, that helped that afternoon. This was a book donation event that was organized by the foundation and uh, we all came together, staff, volunteers, and members of different organizations to help with that event, which helped us bring um, library uh, donated materials and also uh, well, donated materials to the library and help us raise some funds. Um, in this page, we chose to highlight the 10th annual Authors Gala, which is the signature spring um, fundraising event by the Library Foundation. We've also highlighted the yearly contribution that the foundation uh, brought us in the number of volunteers and volunteer hours. This is just a sample again of the wonderful work that these organizations um, helped us with. We had some online and in-person fundraising, pandemic related staff outreach. Our staff was out in the community um, helping and providing services and everything that we could help. Um, we had one of our staff was helping with census calls. I was out um, helping with COVID testing and so many other staff were, uh, were out in the community. So we chose to highlight that as well. Um, and at the bottom here, we were showing um, the foundation motto, which is open doors, open minds and open community. And then to close our report, we have last page, the map with all of the lo three locations with addresses and uh, pictures. So that is our impact report for 2021. And I am very thankful um, to the time and the work of our staff, um, our task force who um, helped us once again. Uh, some of them are here tonight participating in this meeting. Uh, Dina Gomez, our executive assistant. Uh, John Jung, our supervising library assistant. Um, two librarians from the Information Services Division, Madison Rees, Noreen Tree, and myself, Senior Management Analyst, Marcia Mendonca from the um, admin office. So this is our impact report. This was a great presentation. This came out so nice. And um, it's really impressive, actually very professional. Um, I had a, a, one question um, and a thought. I was amazed that we did 385 programs. It's just a huge number. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you happen to know, is that more than we normally would do non-COVID times or 
Is that sort of what we typically do in a year? And we typically do a lot of programs. Um, I can look, I can't tell you exactly how it compares to the last year um, or two years, but I can get that information for you and let you know. But we do have a lot of programs um, every year. And, and our staff did an amazing job pivoting to the virtual um, space. Yeah. And so I imagine there's not a, a, a big difference here. Um, it's just, we were very, just very successful in transitioning to the virtual space. It's excellent. Yeah, I think it's so much easier too to participate. I think I did, I attended more things than I normally would just because it was easy and convenient. Mm -hmm. um, but that was great. That, my question was, I saw on one of the slides early on, we had given away 4,000 plus books. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. were most of those books from that one drive-through drive event we did where people dropped off their books? Okay, so um, it, so the, the donation of books, those are, those are actually for um, school children. So those are, uh, those, um, those are part of the summer learning program. Ah, okay. Every year we donate, um, we, we purchase uh, well, we receive through grants, we receive books um, that are donated to school children and we go everywhere to all of the schools in the regions. I, I personally participated in one um, along with uh, Chelsea, one of our previous uh, children librarians. So we go into the community with a lot of books and we just call them into um, Mattel. So we, we bring Mattel and let them choose the books, um, the book they would like. So that's part of the summer learning program. That's great. So those are all new books. All new books. Mm -hmm. Got it. Because I know there were there had to be thousands that were dropped off that one day. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that event was the donation where we took um, materials in, and you are right. We had um, the Laura room was filled <laughs> to capacity yes. um, with books and materials. Yes. So those books, we've um, the the vault, the friends of the library volunteers they sorted those, um, and because we couldn't host a regular fall book sale available to the public, um, we decided to host a a small scale sale to um, vendors that we work with who mm. usually come and, and shop a lot of materials from us, and. Um, and teachers from the schools wow. nearby. So I, at that time, I was um, the volunteer coordinator, and I actually worked. I I coordinated all of the the sales to make it safe for everyone. So I scheduled those uh, vendors and and teachers to come in um, during a certain time and let them shop. Um, and we raised almost five thousand um, wow. dollars from that book drive. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Trustee Diaz Nat. Uh, thank you so much. And Marcia, this is just a lovely report. Um, as James knows, this is one of the things I look forward to the most every year because this mm -hmm. is how you tell your story. And as a marketer, I really appreciate the high quality of the, the effort, the way the colors come together, the way it ties everything. You look at the page with Mateo and the blues and the greens, and then it pops off on the page as well. So it's really nicely done. And the graphics are very accessible. And I think you've done a great job of choosing which statistics to highlight things that would impress people like 385 programs. Wow, who knew, right? Um, and so that's, that's fantastic. And I would hope that next year when you do it again, that you're able to take it to the next level and start to give people trends about, I mean, this year was such a wacky year, it's hard to compare it versus anything else. But like when we were looking at the statistics earlier in the meeting, um, it was such good news to me to see that the holds filled were going down a lot and the real circulation was going up a lot because that said, to me, people are coming back to the library, right? And so numbers can really tell a, a very powerful story. So I'd encourage you to think about how you do that next year when you start to have a little bit more of a stable base, because I think there's some really great stories 
across the different categories and also between the, you know, the, the head branch and the, the branch branches, <laughs> all three of them in there, they fulfill different roles for different people. So the more you can start to tell those trends going forward, I think it would be just really interesting and encourage people to get more involved. But congratulations. <laughs> and I, I hope that this is something we'll, we'll all be taking out and promoting it through all of our networks, everybody at the library. You know, I'd love to have, see a, 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 something next year that talks about the tech lending that we start this year, what happens and who used it and what did they do with it and, and all of that. So just such a great platform, congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I do. I, I, I love your suggestion to, to think about the trends. Uh, we'll definitely think of that as a team. And as far as the graphics, I want to let you know that Madison and Noreen created, they put all together, we worked as a team to choose some of the pictures, um, but mainly they created this report themselves as far as the graphics. Uh, they use Canva. Uh, so this is all produced in-house. Um, it's, it's all done by them and they did an amazing job at um, working with the, the color scheme. We, we've, they put together two choices and we voted on the color scheme. And um, yeah, this is a result of their, their talents, artistic talent. <laughs> they did a great job and the team supported them in a great way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just want to thank Marcia and um, her team for uh, giving the foundation such a, um, a prominent shout out um, in this communication. It matters to us um, that we are considered um, a valuable partner to the library um, and we want patrons and people who read this communication to, to see us as such. Um, and they were very generous um, giving us the space and making us look good. And we appreciate it and including the motto. And so I wanted to thank her for that. Great. Thank you, Lynn, you're welcome. Uh, Trustee Lynn Harris. Uh, yeah, just uh, echo the thoughts. I mean, the layout's fantastic. Uh, the way you made certain parts of it pop to bring it to the eye. But in particular, I really want to note the comments because the comments really show the patron centered focus, which is what it's all about. So just congratulations. That's just a testament to the, the good work everyone's doing. So congratulations. It's just uh, that, that says it all to me. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Uh, any other thoughts? I don't see any other hands. Oh, James. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say thank you to that group. And, um, you know, what's interesting to me is, well, first of all, I'm like super, I'm like really beaming. Like, I'm so proud of the people on our management team and the way they're presenting here and, and, and the things that they've done. But it's also so interesting to me how, um, how I'm constantly learning, working here, working with this group of people and like it feeds my curiosity. So John's background in music and technology comes into play in helping to develop, you know, the um, expanded lending uh, resources we have. I know that, um, you know, Noreen does our um, galleries. Um, um, Marcia has a background in retail and a wonderful sense of aesthetics that combine with her business acumen and education. Um, um, Madison as well. And Dina can, you know, Dina can do just about anything from an administrative point of view. And it's just so great to work at a place that where we can, um, where we can find ways to really use and bring out people's talents and experience. And it comes out in so many interesting ways because I have to tell you, I'm sure you have acknowledged it, but a ton of work goes into making this document flow so smoothly and mm -hmm. pop aesthetically and be clean and, and packed with information yet simple enough for people to get the main point. So I am just as blown away as you all. And, mm -hmm. you know, each time I see this and, and, and the wonderful way that they present it, I'm just, I'm just so impressed. And, and, and 
just blown away. So thank you both. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcia. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. Okay. So we're moving on to item seven, updated public service hours pilot proposal. So I'll turn it over to city librarian more. Thank you. You might be muted there. Give me one moment to pull up the pull up the correct document. I got so into listening to um, to this. Let me see. Okay. So I'm just going to assume that everyone. Um, can or has perused the document or it can look at it in the agenda packet. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the upsides of the the pandemic, one of the silver linings, I guess, was that it forced us to rethink rethink things um, and to experiment with some things in which, you know, that we may have been thinking about. And so, you know, one of the things that I think um, that I have been thinking about for years and, and just observing, communicating with patrons, communicating with staff was, were we allocating our, um, our operation, our opening hours to the best? And then I think one of the things that also, you know, really came to the forefront of my mind, thanks to the board members too, was, were we providing enough service to to the branches? Um, was it were we being as equitable as possible? So you know some of the specific things that stood out to me were um, was the amount of uh, investment put into the last hour uh, of us being open eight to nine four days a week was it worth the payoff? Um, should we be open earlier on Sundays, which are surprisingly um, busy and, and we open pretty late? Um, and I, I know there's a context for some of these things. Like there are some libraries that aren't open on Sundays at all. Um, there was a time where a lot of libraries were all open till nine. Um, and then there's some libraries that, you know, close on Thursdays. So, you know, with the pandemic, I think we were able to step back and really have some in-depth discussions. And as you all know, I did a survey uh, of the patrons. Um, I think it was about two weeks. Is that right, Marcia, that we had it out or a month? It was a month. Okay. And I think we got several hundred responses, probably around 300 responses. And then I did a survey also of the staff. As you can imagine, um, the feedback was was wise, was dis, dis, disparate. Um, there were some people that thought, you know, it would be great if we could be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> um, there were some people who worked here who said we should just be closed on weekends. <laughs> um, so, you know, I try to sort through that. Not many people work here said, I think I only saw one, <laughs> but it was like, really? Come on. Um, but so you try to sort through that and you try to say what is understanding that whatever we do is going to probably not thrill someone, but what gives, what would be the best for the largest percentage of our patrons? And one of the things that comes to mind was for a long time, we had unlimited parking. And my first year here, Ben decided that we needed to have a two hour limit, which between us is really softly enforced. But obviously when Ben went forth, I watched him because there were some people that said, you know, how could you put a two hour limit? I studied for four hours, this is so unfair. But Ben went forward with the understanding that yeah, but the greater good would, would, would benefit from having a two hour parking limit because quite frankly, we have people who figured out quite naturally that 
if there's no limit on parking at the library, you could just park here for eight hours and work downtown. And they did it for years. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, making that move, which was going to be good for most people, did not, um, did not prevent some people from saying, hey, you know, um, why don't you just put a, um, put meters down there? Or, you know, why would you limit me, et cetera? It was a handful of people. Ultimately, most people accepted it. The library is fine. And we are able to allow more people to use the library because we don't have um, 50 plus spots being taken up for eight hours a day by people who are not even in the library. So that's how I view adopting, uh, uh, um, adjusting our hours. We certainly have some students and people who meet here from eight to nine and they make good use of the library. They are quite a small percentage. We also certainly have some of our, um, what I would say is uh, our unhoused patrons who um, often stay in the library as late as they can and they benefit from it. And, we, and, and usually there's no problem. But many nights um, that eight to nine hour is pretty dead. And the feeling for me was that many nights there's almost as many staff in the library as the number of patrons. So that's the external part. The internal part is we have people who would get off at nine and sometimes get at home at get home at 11 because they have to take multiple trains and get back to the city. Having worked in libraries myself, I know that night when you usually work till nine, you're usually toast the next day. You know, it's hard to unwind, et cetera. So if I thought it were worth it, I would continue with it. But as far as students go, college libraries tend to be open later. So you have College of San Mateo, you have San Jose State, there are alternatives. Um, and so I just started to think, you know, we saw during the pandemic and we are certainly picking up again, it's wonderful to see the number of people in the building. But we saw during the pandemic that um, even when we're open to seven is usually slowing down quite a bit at Maine. And we, I really felt like based on the feedback, obviously there were some people that would, would say, well, maybe you could open till nine. I mean, stay open, open at nine in the morning and close at seven. I would like to get there early. I think the sweet spot is for us to open at 10. Um, I do gather that most people, and we know this too from um, our statistics on the use of, usage of our meeting rooms, our peak hours are, I'm sorry, the library closing. Our peak hours are typically one to six. Um, and they're really, I would say our peak hours are really like three to six. Um, so I felt that um, closing at eight, in addition to some of the shenanigans that I would see uh, in our in our um, in our um, underground parking lot after eight, I even asked um, at one point I asked San Mateo Police Department if they would just patrol. Um, generally, not anything scary, but um, you know, just um, local teens taking advantage of the parking lot to it was frankly become the, the makeout spot. Um, um, evidence of people, you know, smoking pot or smoking cigarettes. Um, um, Gee, it's an opportunity <laughs> to teach them about literature. Hey, they gotta go somewhere. We just don't want to be that spot. <laughs> um, but generally, you know, like people repairing their cars and it's like, hey, you know, this is not really dangerous, but you know, the darkness in the parking lot underground. And there was a couple of incidents too which were more concerning, such as a young woman who came to tutor each evening. And I met with her and her mom because she was like, there's a guy that, you know, was following me. He knew where I tutor in the room. And then when I went to the parking lot, I saw him standing by the door. So she came back in and talked to the staff and I met with her and, you know, we just, you know, talked, I, I was, we were never able to identify him, but we met with the police etc. And so I just thought, you know, the risk of that eight to nine hour is not to me worth the payoff. So how can we use those hours better? 
We, we played around with maybe opening till six on Fridays, um, but decided that the best payoff is to add some hours to Sunday, which is seems to be a very popular day amongst families. Um, and then to add some hours to the branches. Um, and if you look at the what I am proposing, it is a net gain of a couple of hours overall. Um, and I think we're just gonna get more bang for the buck. I'm not going, going to go into all the details. I really just wanted to give you all an opportunity to really ask me any questions you have or real concerns, because this is not even um, set in stone. We're, we're, we have a lot of work to go through. It's really challenging to adapt people's, to um, adjust people's schedules, particularly on Sundays. And um, I was advised by city manager, Drew Corbett, to make it a pilot, which is to say, we try this, worst case scenario, we go back to the hours that we had before. That's the worst case scenario. If it's not working, I am not wedded to it. But I really believe after a lot of thought and a lot of review of a lot of surveys and a lot of discussions, uh, I'm really proud of the staff because most of them didn't just say, I want this for myself. They really thought about when I asked the branch staff, like for example, rather than opening one evening a week until eight, they too said at the branches that seven to eight hour was dead. How about we open a couple of evenings and instead of being open till eight, we'll open one evening to seven and one evening to six. Um, so ask me um, whatever questions you have, critique it. If you are like this, this part of it doesn't really sound good to me. What are you thinking? I wanna hear all of that because there's still time to consider, tighten it up, adjust, whatever. So that's that's my spiel. Thank you, <laughs> Trustee Diaz now. Well, number one, I love the fact that you spent so much time doing research and talking to our clients, talking to our staff. I mean, that's, that's how you get there. And yes, it has to be a pilot because it is new and you will learn and you will tweak. So you can't, it would not be wise to say, this is what we're doing, period, put it in stone. So I think that's great. I gave yourself enough time in the pilot to really learn because if it goes out now, it's the beginning of March, people may use the library differently than they do in July. Correct. I mean, all that kind of stuff. And coming out of COVID, and there's so much we don't know, we don't know. So just give yourself a long lead and then really have a good tracking system mm -hmm. in place so that you can say afterwards, you know, at Marina Branch, we found that older patrons really liked X, but it really didn't help our younger patrons because blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And you know, your, your staff is gonna be able to tell you what those segments are and what those questions should be and who are the important people to get feedback from. Because I can tell you right now, I'm not the one to ask what should you do with the library at 10 a.m. on Sunday? I'm doing other things Sunday. <laughs> I come in in the afternoon with most of the crowds, mm -hmm. right? So my opinion Sunday morning is not going to be as valuable. But okay. um, so really, really understand how do you segment and how do you track? I mean, that's always what, you know, what I, what I ask about. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the other question I'd have for you to think about is, how are you going to promote this? Because mm -hmm. it, I love the fact that you're putting more hours in Marina and Hillsdale. I think that's mm -hmm. just fantastic. Um, but at each of the branches, it's it's pretty different. And one day it's this, one day it's that. Mm -hmm. And that may be unsettling to people sure. who are used to hearing, okay, it's Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and I can plan my schedule doesn't mean it's mm -hmm. the best set of hours just means you have to spend time thinking about how do we promote it so people don't walk up and say but you were open at six last night how mm -hmm. come you're only open till five this night so please help your patrons understand 
you you bring up some good points and we went back and forth over the branch hours and it was that exact point. Um, should we be open 11 to six, you know, most days because maybe that gives a little more time to the kids after school. Um, but then of course you have your regular, some seniors who come every morning at 10 and read the, the newspapers. So we try to split the difference, but the branch staff is, is concerned um, that it could be an adjustment. Um, for people to get used to the fact that, yeah, a couple of days a week is, is um, instead of just one day a week previously where they open at noon, that they're going to be a couple of days a week um, that are not the 10 to 5 schedule. Regarding Sunday mornings, um, we're not going to open at 10. You're, you're right about that. I think it would be dead. Um, but we are going to open at um, 11 on Sunday morning. <laughs> And that is still early for some people to want to go to the, the, the library on Sunday morning. They're lounging. Um, we kind of decided that was a sweet spot compromise. There is an alternative, which is to open um, Sunday at noon uh, instead of 11 to 5, or um, which we're proposing, or 1 to 5, which we've been doing, to open noon to 5, and then maybe add an hour on Friday. And, and and close at six on Friday. That's what you're you're going to find out from your yes. customer base yeah. what works for them, and just make sure you're listening closely to them and to your staff because they're going to be able to tell you. And I and 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 be honest. I mean, you're be honest with them. Say, look, we're trying mm -hmm. something out. We heard from all of you that you know changing our timing schedule might be better. Mm -hmm. so we really need your feedback. Help us. Help us okay. help you. Turn it into a, a positive benefit. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, my feeling is um, most people like me will for completely forget what the pre-COVID hours were. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great time now because each branch plus the main are gaining hours. No one's going to be complaining about that. Um, so I don't, I, I think I'd be more interested to hear what the staff think, I guess, because I think the public will be thrilled with more hours. Mm -hmm. And then my other comment is on the Sunday morning, I think that's going to do really well, but I mm -hmm. think we need to put sort of a big sign out in front, mm -hmm. like we're open, you know, Yeah. because <laughs> people won't know. Um, but I think once they realize it's open earlier. You're going to be surprised how many people come in at 11, I think. I actually, I actually agree with you, Lisa, because I had a staff person speak with me today about how we were going to do Sundays. And we still have to figure that out. As it stands now, because we're only open four hours, the people on the desk will just come in and they'll just work on that desk for four hours, excluding their break. Even adding one hour, one hour, of service means that we have to figure out a way to stagger people. Um, but I said, well, you know, you know, she's like, well, I don't wanna be on a desk for six hours. I said, that's what we're working out. We're not gonna put anyone on the desk for six hours. I said, but, um, you know, we could just stay um, um, one to five and then we could just keep the hours we have. And she said, no, 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 you don't. And she said, you don't understand. We'll, we'll be busy on Sunday. We'll be busy if we open at 11. Because I said, maybe we could just have one person on a desk and it'll be slower early in the morning. And she was like, no, I think it's going to be busy at 11 because we always have people waiting. Yeah. So yeah. That, will be, that will be something we'll have to test. And I think Lisa makes a good point, which is that we'll, we're going to need to market ahead. We're going to need to put signs out. We're, as you said, Liz, we're going to need to put things out saying we're now open at 11 on Sundays. I really don't think uh, uh, um, most people are going to uh, be bothered with us closing at eight. I was someone that may go to the library after eight and grab something and leave before, but eight was plenty of time for me. Most people are at home uh, eating dinner or watching TV unless they're going, unless they're a student. And then they typically have a university or community college library to go to. That's what I think. And I think one thing you all should know about me is that I really do my best not to get too wedded to an idea and think 
this is right, I got tunnel vision. Um, I have no problem in saying, we tried this, we found something surprising and we need to pivot or we need to go backwards based off of what, what we learned. But I really do think that we have put as much thought and consideration, looked at this from as many angles as possible to at least attempt the pilot. I like it. Uh, Trustee Voss. Yeah, I think this is really interesting and I'm definitely impressed by the amount of thought that you put into it. I remember when the library was handing out kind of the surveys about what hours you wanted to see and then debriefing with the staff and observations, you've clearly looked at it from, from a bunch of different angles. Um, I second what Lisa was saying of, of thinking now about like what data you're gonna be looking at as a pilot to kind of make the decision. And so some of the monthly circulation things you might be able to look at if there's any noticeable changes there. I don't know if you automatically can collect data about like when books were returned or checked out, but that could be kind of an interesting thing to look at. I don't know if that's registered or, or something to actually see okay, during those hours, how many books were checked out or how many weren't just to get that kind of really concrete um, information there. I think I, I understand about kind of splitting the difference with the, the branch libraries. I do worry ab about some of the inconsistency, right? Like a different time on Monday, different time Tuesday, different time Wednesday. And I think if I had one pushback, it would, it would be that. It would be like, maybe just make Monday and Tuesday the same mm -hmm. so that people can remember it easier because not being able to remember might screw up if people use it or not. Um, okay. I don't know if, the, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of people probably check before they go. So maybe that's not a huge concern, but that would be the one, one thing to look at potentially. Actually, uh, Austin, first of all, thank you for the feedback. And I think a lot of people check before they come, but <laughs> there's a considerable number that don't. Yeah. And we know this because we've had the same hours for years and we still have people lining Showing up. up the time yeah. Where yeah. We're like, We've had you know we're not open. And you're like, yeah. you're, so um, we're just going to be honest with ourselves about that. And this is something that the branch staff have pointed out. Yeah, they've been like, we don't want to confuse people, and their relationships with community members are even more um, intimate than the ones at the at the main library. Yeah, I mean, they're seeing the same people in that neighborhood, the same kids, so. If it turns out that that is an issue, um, no problem. We, we will either tweak it, scrap it, or try something, uh, try something different. Like I said, the worst case scenario, we could just say, you know what? The, the previous hours weren't perfect, but they were good enough. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what we'll learn. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. How soon do you anticipate um, starting the pilot? Well, um, so, the library's closed. <laughs> they make three announcements. B, it should be open 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, we anticipate, so you just asked a good question because I need to point out something. There was a, an error on the document I gave you all. We the don't last have, item. Yes. <laughs> We were not, we were not, we are not bound to give staff a 30 day notice before we adjust hours by the labor agreement. We try to do that as a courtesy. So technically, you know, we, we need to give them some reasonable um, warning so that they can adjust, make life adjustments, et cetera. But the, the way I see it is that I think, uh, I think that the the city manager wants to uh wants me to present this to the city council at the march 21st meeting and originally drew had said do you think you can restore hours um sometime in march and we said yes yeah, we i think we can do that but that's not possible one of the things i've learned is that when you like basically change your whole schedule, your whole staffing schedule, everything for like two years. You can't just change it to something else in a month. So realistically, I think we'll be looking at like um, 
um, sometime in April, probably mid April would be the earliest realistically that we could um, get the marketing information out, get it up on the website, uh, make sure that staff have adequate time to you know, make the adjustments in, in their lives so that we can adjust the schedule. And most importantly, I think the most difficult part of this and the most difficult part to really explain to people um, externally is it's gonna be a very complex operation for the managers to revamp the schedule. It's like a game of Jenga, right? You know, you move one piece somewhere and on the outside, it looks like, what's the big deal? You just add in an hour, but it just adjusts everything. And we are tightly budgeted for our staffing. So every any little adjustment um, is complex and complicated. It can be done. It just has to be looked at from a variety of angles and it has to be coordinated. And thankfully, you know, Rokshana, she's better at that than me. She's working with the division heads to, um, to adjust the scheduling part of it is because she did it for a long time, but it's complicated. So I would say, Liz, to be realistic at best, at the soonest, mid-April, but I'm really thinking late April, maybe yeah. beginning of May. It'd be nice if it coordinated with the National Library Week, but I'm not sure what week that is. Uh, I think that's the third week of April. Am uh, Maybe that will just work out the same time. Second week of April. Yeah, that'd okay. be great. Yeah, or we're going to announce it. Yeah, know. we're going to. That, that's a very good point. Uh, I will note that. Great. Any right. other any other thoughts, questions? Great. Thank you, James. Thank you all. Actually, National Library Week is the first full week of April. Excuse me. Ah, okay. So let's see. All right. Well, we can maybe announce it at least. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm going to move on to reports and announcements. Um, so, James, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, thankfully, I, I have a pretty short city librarian's report. I just want to update everyone that the state library grant um, application to um, make repairs to. Staff leaving the building. Anyone's going to stay other than James? After closing, <laughs> please call 7833. All right. So um, so the, the, the official application um, for the uh, Emergency Infrastructure Fund from the State Library of California opened on um, um, February 14th, and the application due date is March 21st. We are well ahead of the game because Roshana did a preliminary application back in November. And a lot of the information is transferring, but we do have to work with public works and finance um, to coordinate and also to provide details on the structural report. So Austin, this has to do with, um, the Marina Library has a slanted um, floor and it was evaluated as being safe um, several years ago, but that something has to be done about it. It does weird things like sh the building shifts subtly and for years, the, the back door, which is the most beautiful feature of that library, the back patio, sometimes that door won't open because of subtle shifts in the building. And what we're looking at doing is providing a bridge repair until we can figure out whether or not there's gonna be a joint venture, um, new library rec center with parks and rec, or whether there could be some sort of new library um, that it builds on the momentum that is created by um, expected development and housing to be added to that area. So what we're doing is applying for a $1.25 million matching grant where the city would come up with $1.25 million to make structural repairs that would add 10 years of life to the Marina branch and give us time to um, go forth with um, funding First of all, deciding which direction to go in, in as far as um, either replacing that, that uh, library in that area or someplace nearby. So the good news is the application is well underway. The due date is March 21st. I would say the application is probably four fifths finished. And we really think we have a really, really good chance 
of um, getting a $1.25 million and matching it from the city. And very specific thanks to the library board and specifically um, board president, um, Liz DeWinter, who really, really advocated for the Marina branch, got it to the attention of the right people on the city council. And now there is suddenly there, there we just started to see act traction and movement. So that's that. Um, on the 19th, um, I attended the, the event on order uh, 9066, which led to the internment of um, 120 Japanese Americans after the attack, of, uh, uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, the Japanese Americans that were interned were never charged with anything criminally. Bay Area native um, Steve Okamoto was five weeks old when he and his family were interned. There were several trustees there, so I won't go into it a whole lot except to say I thought it was just a, a really fantastic program. I was honored to be asked to get up and um, do the welcoming uh, statement uh, on behalf of um, Carla Abatable, who brought that program to our library and, and just did a wonderful job of, of producing it all. Um, turns out, <laughs> I guess our I guess our city council and our city management office doesn't have a lot of experience with final elimination. So they're sort of working through this, but this is the last thing that I, I got, which is um, at first I was told that they hadn't voted on it. Uh, and then when I followed up on it after our last board meeting, I was told that I just need to put it on the consent calendar. Um, I couldn't get it on time for the meeting next month. I mean, next week, three, seven, March 7th, because that would, it would have had to been turned in on February 22nd. But I have it on the city council consent calendar for a March 21st city council meeting. And my understanding is that it will be approved by consent decree, if I phrase that correctly. So it should be just one of those things where um, a list of items are, are shared on the consent calendar the city council is asked, um, do they approve the items? And that should make it official at the March 21st meeting that we will officially eliminate fines at San Mateo Public Library. So that's my report and let me know if you have any questions. I have a question about that. Is that kind of, once it's approved, is that an instant change or will that take some time? No, my understanding is that that's it. And one of the reasons we really, we really pushed for this was because, you know, we're still under emergency order where fines are suspended. Right. And we just wanted to get this in place before the emergency order was removed. And we just don't have to deal with it any, anymore. We can just say, listen, our fines are eliminated. Our patrons have been wonderful. I think it's a wonderful reward to our community for being trustworthy you one of the things i learned is that there is such a thing as just um you know, as a shared sense of responsibility and a shared resource at least in our city so it's one of those things where we are not gaining anything close to what we would be losing by continuing to uh, charge fines and my understanding is once it's approved on march 21st at, on the consent calendar it is official that's great. By the way, thank you so much for the update on the Marina branch. And I just wanted to say that some people don't think local government works very well, but I think in this case, um, I'm amazed how quickly things have progressed. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions for James? Why don't we um, move to Lynn? Um, if if you're able to give us an update on the foundation. Oh, there you are. Right. Um, sorry, all kinds of technical difficulties, um, but I am listening. Um, not much to report right now. Uh, we are gearing up for spring fundraising, which this year will be coordinated with National Library Week. So um, one of the things that we are doing with, um, with the library, um, and first of all, thank you for the partnership once more. Um, is we are piggybacking on a lot of special activities that will be happening um, in the library as a result of uh, library staff programming. And we have been able to offer 
sponsors um, this year a presented by opportunity at a specific level. So for example, um, the tech lending petting zoo, uh, which is going to be all week long, uh, will be presented by a foundation sponsor. Um, so it will be subtle. We don't want to turn this into, you know, a stadium naming contest. Um, but in lieu of a gala, um, we thought that this was um, a very special opportunity for um, our sponsors to be actually in the library next to the programs that their money helps fund. So uh, we appreciate the library staff working with us on that. Um, and then the other thing um, that is happening during National Library Week is that the uh, we are having the second annual poetry award, a youth poetry contest, and the award ceremony will be on Wednesday, um, April 6th in the afternoon. It's also Library Giving Day. And we anticipate also having a uh, reception for um, leadership circle donors and um, legacy fund um, founding members, uh, at which time we hope to be able to unveil um, the plaque. It will not be installed um, and doing, uh, dealing with all the COVID related production issues, um, we may not even have the actual product but we're going to use this as a um, an opportunity to invite these folks into the library to see them for the first time in many cases for about two years um, the reception itself is uh, going to be very low key it's probably the equivalent of a glass of wine and some cookies or something um, but mostly uh, just an opportunity to bring people back to a safe public space um, on terms that we know uh, we can interact with them. Hopefully the weather will be fine enough that it would, even with just a sweater, we can be on the patio outside the Oak Room to provide further um, comfort to people. Um, as a VIP group, um, you'll get an invitation. So I will make sure that um, we keep you posted on the details. Um, we're still working out the final um, logistics and the timing, but um, I'll keep you posted. It'll be Wednesday, April 6th. And you're, you're still figuring out the time. Yeah, it will be in the evening um, during library hours. The uh, we what we're navigating right now is the Poetry Contrast Awards. Um, if you recall, there are three winners: um, a third to fifth, a sixth to eighth, and then a grand prize winner overall. And um, mostly, we want to make sure. I don't think that that takes a long time, but we were really hoping to um, invite the participant children, their families to come into the library, maybe hear a little bit of a recital. Last year, we uh, we publicized everything with a Zoom uh, recording and that was actually quite lovely. Um, but again, this is one of those things where we wanna take advantage of the fact that um, we are now emerging from some level of isolation, which actually this, I almost forgot to mention this. The theme this year for the foundations ask um, is improving the user experience. So National Library Week, for those of you who don't know, um, is a American Library Association um, week. And they set the, um, the theme this year, it's connect with your library. They, I think, also provide some marketing materials like logos and as well as some suggestions for, for libraries that may want to have stuff. They have a spokesperson that's Molly Shannon this year. So they try and they try and make this a, a high visibility event for public libraries across the U.S. For our purposes, the foundation um, typically uses the springtime to make a more specific ask. Generally, we're making general asks during the, the fall, and in the spring, we, we sort of highlight a service or initiative that the library um, is, is engaged with that we would like to promote. And so this year, we're going to do sort of a past, present, future of imagining uh, what it means to be back in the building. And going back to our roots as a capital campaign to sort of celebrate how we got the building built, some of the improvements that we've made um, since today, some immediate needs such as um, potential monitors in the, um, the small workrooms, uh, maybe a phone booth for private calls. You know, these are all things that people now back in the building would appreciate having, um, as well as some, uh, some dividers 
um, on some of the group work tables to give people a sense of privacy um, and safety while they they may share public workspaces. So um, so those are the things we'll tell people could be immediate immediate future things like within the next 12 15 months. And then we're going to start teeing up the conversations about what do we want the spaces to be like for the future. And in particular, re, um, sort of resurfacing the whole roadmap for the space modification plan, um, reminding people that um, the teen area um, really could use some enclosure. We can move the cafe downstairs. Um, there's a whole periodical storage area that could become a, an adult maker space. Um, and kind of set the stage that, in fact, the foundation may be starting to emphasize um, our fundraising a little differently. Um, and that's a TBD. The board needs to engage on um, a strategic planning um, initiative, and that's going to happen. It was anticipated in February. It's probably not going to happen until March or April at this point. But we'll be making some decisions about um, you know, what the best use um, of our energies as an organization is to, um, to really make an impact here at the library on behalf of um, the patrons and everything. So, um, so that's one of the first things we're gonna do is just give people an opportunity to, to reimagine those things. Great, thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to turn um, off again because I. Yeah, that's never, fine. <laughs> I, I never know if I'm going to lose the audio, so sorry. No problem. Um, my report's quick. I, I just wanted to mention uh, the same program that James mentioned with Steve Okamoto, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I learned a lot. And other than one tense moment during a Q and A, <laughs> which <laughs> yeah. I was very impressed with Mr. Okamoto and Councilwoman Lee, um, but um, just it was a great um, program. So thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Trustee Lynn Harris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, three, three things. Number one, I just echo the comments on the uh, gathering about the internment camps. Very, very interesting. And yes, a tense moment or two in the Q&A uh, that was massaged quite nicely. Uh, number two, uh, I had the opportunity to go by and see the um, calendar, if you will, that's set up in the Senior Center for Black History Month. Very, very impressive, very cool project, uh, hand-drawn little things, each about maybe four square inches, uh, each of the dates in February, a significant African-American. Very, very nice, very creative, and I'm sure educational. And then third, I want to uh, compliment um, the librarian, James, uh, not on the fact that he refuses to go to 24 hours opening for the library, but uh, no, I had asked James um, a month or so ago about statistical reports from a previous year so that we could do apples to apples comparison in some of these things. And he got them, uh, provided them to me. I had a chance to look at them and just a number of things were very interesting. But one thing that kind of stood out was that uh, this January, so January of 22, the month that we just completed uh, 28 days ago, obviously, you know, streamed down, limited access, so on and so forth. The numbers in that month in terms of, you know, circulation and things taken out and so on and so forth were very comparable, almost identical to January of 2018. So four years ago is, you know, kind of a long time ago, but I just found it amazing that the library has grown so much that in four years, you had a month like the one we just went through when obviously things were very constrained and the level of activity was what it was four years ago in a wide open month. So that's... Uh, Congrats and I think kudos to, uh, again, the patron-centered focus, which we've heard a number of times on this call and that we've all seen and I think are very proud of. So anyway, thanks for the info, James. And that was an interesting little nugget. That was that was great to see. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, Justy Diaz-Nash. Uh, thank you, President DeWinter. I also was at the um, ceremony or the event memorializing uh, the internment executive order. And the other thing I would add is that the room was packed. I mean, that was, and that, that's the Oak Room. That's a big room. And it was a beautiful Saturday afternoon. And there were lots of other things for people to do. And people, all different kinds of people were there. So I think the more we can do things like that, the better, because we really are the center of the community. And we, you know, we have the opportunity to 
to do that. So um, I would totally recommend we we focus on doing more of that going forward. So that, that's my comment for the day. I thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, just as a heads up, James, maybe I was at a, a fundraiser and Congresswoman Spear was there. And uh, she, we were talking in chit chat and she said, you know, once I'm no longer in Washington all the time, I don't want to forget about how the library was going to go do something about civics. I think that's a great idea and I look forward to getting involved. And I just smiled and said, thank you very much. I'll make sure to let our head librarian know. <laughs> so just as a heads up, James. Sure. Well, we're thinking about it. And I, and I, I shared something with Lisa a while ago. I shared um, Civics page from um, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Obviously, they're a much bigger, much better resource. But we might be able to take some ideas from them. And that could be, that could be a starting place. And mm -hmm. the deal I would make is... I would um, I would probably want to start with something like that where we started with like electronic stuff on our web page where people could see resources and to be able to uh, talk with you more, Lisa, as far as like some of the direction that you think um, Congresswoman Spear is. is, no, is one Congresswoman can't direct an entire program. Of course well, not. I wanted to, I mean, it's it's up to you and your staff where you think right. the most effective programming is. I'm just saying there will be potentially heightened interest and renewed focus. Sure. As opposed to when somebody was in Washington being very busy on other things. Totally. And I also yeah. take that to mean that we probably can we probably can uh, recruit her oh, to, do, <laughs> to do uh, one, help us with one of our civics program and Absolutely. launch it on a very high note. Absolutely. So, good luck. Yeah, thanks for passing that along. Uh, Trustee Bowles? I unfortunately don't have anything to report. I wasn't able to make the event. Um, I did swing by the Marina branch, but it was closed on the note of uh, open hours there. But it was still, I hadn't, I hadn't been by there before. So that was, that was pretty nice to see that area. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I don't have much to report, unfortunately. No, no worries. Um, any other thoughts or questions before we wrap up? Does, just following up on Trustee Bowles's comment, when we can do things in person, I think, it, and I think President DeWinter, you may have already mentioned this about getting back into the branches for, for meetings, because we had started doing that. And I, that was just such a great idea. Yeah, I, had a, I mean, I would never have realized I was a half an hour early to the meeting um, at the Marina branch. I got the time wrong. I think we moved it back and I didn't realize, but it was great because I walked around the whole, and that's how I realized about the floor being, you know, sloping. So yeah, I think I think once we're back in person, we probably should go to Hillsdale at least. And, absolutely. And then back and forth. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that was a good idea. Yeah. Uh, President DeWinter? Yeah. Uh, just real quick, I'd like to put in a reinforce, I guess not put in, but reinforce the plug for programs such as the one on Executive Order 9066. I just think this community has such a, a you know high level of intellectual curiosity that things like that are just, uh, I mean, you always would draw a crowd. I mean, like, like Trustee Nash mentioned, it was four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon that was glorious. So it wasn't even really the optimal time, but uh, full crowd of people wholly engaged. And it gets, again, the, 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 this kind of community, I think would really just thrives on that kind of thing. So um, those things are, are priceless, so. Definitely. Great, anything else? I just wanna, oh. I have a couple of quick things. Uh, one um, is in regards to the event. Um, and I, I agree with uh, Vice President Rodling Harris um, in it, because that is my case. I was there just as curiosity um, because during the pandemic and using Canopy, I've watched two documentaries about um, how the Italians were instrumental in, in helping the US during the World War II. And then how all of a sudden they had to go into internment camping. And so I've learned a lot of history um, 
because of the library and, and canopy our resources. So when I saw that program, I was so happy that Carla had um, put that together for us. And so I was home taking care of other things, but I made a point of being there to hear from someone who experienced um, internment camp firsthand. So um, I do think that our community would be very interested in more events like that. Um, that is the first one. And then second is also in regards to uh, a question, uh, Vice President Rodlin Harris had for, for us in regards to the girls who called um, in the financial report last time. So, um, you know, as I'm new to this position, I'm almost a year in, but still learning about um, a lot of things. I was actually curious about why we didn't have any um, activity for our girls who code, financial activities. So I, I, I tried to look back and it is a group that doesn't have a lot of activities be just because of the nature um, of their program. It's different than a children's program. Um, so they don't need a lot of materials um, or any, you know, any resources. Mostly they use online resources for their coding. Um, but I've learned that that line item was added to the financial report because a few years back, um, the organization Girls Who Code donated um, an amount. It was a small amount, um, less than $100, but they used it for a celebration at the end of uh, one of the sessions. So they purchased you know, um, refreshments and some snacks. Um, and so it was put in to the report back then um, because we had to report the gifts that we received. But in general, they don't need a lot of um, financial resources, um, but I, I, I was curious too. So thank you, I went back to do that research um, as to why we weren't investing as much. But I think your, your, your idea and your thinking was that why are we not investing more in them? Um, but it's... Um, if they just they do conduct their activities, but they don't need a lot of financial resources. Um, that is the, the short answer. And they just resumed um, a new session. So they're meeting on Thursday evenings and they're continuing to study Python. So and they decided to be on site. So they, they're wow. back in the library. <laughs> Thank you. And shame on me. I should have noted, I should have noted that James also uh gave me a little update on the girls that code so i mistakenly omitted that in my little synopsis a couple minutes ago oh no problem <laughs> great thank you and uh thank you marcy and john again for your wonderful presentation thank you very very much i really Excellent. feel like this was a great meeting so. yes. thank you for the kind words thank you for your commitment to uh the community is stellar Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. That's been a great meeting. Thank really you. A lot. Excellent. Who's we that? look forward to what you're going to bring us next time. <laughs> the bar's high now. Exactly. All right, everyone. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Close the library, James. All right. Thanks. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bye.